Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Tonight is Comprehensivist Wednesdays. Uh, tonight we'll be doing our continuing our neuroscience series. Is our human brain seminally unique? Uh, so Sanjay, take it away. All right, thanks, Joe. Um, so uh, I see some some uh, new faces here. Uh, we have been uh, talking about uh, the brain, not just the human brain, but many animal brains. Uh, and every once in a while we delve into artificial intelligence, that's an emerging area um, that actually, believe it or not, it is uh, used in the neurosciences, uh, both in terms of research, but also in terms of modeling to understand aspects of the human brain. Um, and so a lot of our talks have been around bio biological systems, but every once in a while, like I said, we have delved into these artificial systems and tonight we're going to do a little more of that. This is more as a comparative model uh, to try to understand um, this. Now, we're not comparing only uh, human brain with, with AI. What I'd like to do, and with the slides, I have some slides that I'll go into in a, a few minutes. Uh, what I want to do is, is show a comparison between all of the different types of animal models that we have, animals that we have. Um, uh, and now I'm not going to go through you know, many of them, but in a general way, I'm going to show similarities between uh, aspects of brain function in animals and humans, and then correlate those or tie those into what we're starting to see in some of the more sophisticated artificial intelligence systems out there. Um, and so this is a way to compare um, really what is happening in uh, our understanding of uh, neural systems. The brain is a neural system. Brain is an information processing system. Um, and uh, so this is a way for us to understand more and better uh, what is happening. Now, this does not mean that what's happening or the way that these AI systems work is exactly how human brains or animal brains work. They're not necessarily, but some of the, uh, some of the features, some of the aspects that's, that we've been able to study and, and you know, uh, delve into, and actually, we, some of the systems, the AI systems, uh, they're... Uh, in the last few years, they've developed some tools which actually let uh, researchers uh, interrogate. It's almost a, the equivalent of uh, a super sensitive, super high resolution MRI. The MRIs that we have for, for uh, biological systems are not that high resolution, relatively speaking. But for AI systems, they're much more higher resolution. You can actually go down to the individual neurons and study their characteristics. So we're starting to see in some areas, especially for example, the visual systems, um, there are a lot of parallels, even though those visual systems have not intentionally been designed to work the way uh, animal visual systems work. Because of the, um, the way that these networks work, networks of neurons, they've actually evolved and become uh, similar to how uh, biological uh, visual uh, cortices work. So um, that's one example of where um, an artificial system, uh, mathematically, because of the way uh, it uh, is trained. It's trained similar to how you know, human brains and animal brains are trained. The, the way the type of training actually causes them to function in a similar way um, at a deep level to what biological systems do. But um, we don't suspect that other uh, areas of the brain will do the same. Uh, so anyway, um, let's let me start uh, the slides. Um, I have some slides uh, that will help us to. Uh, to go through uh, these, all right, so hopefully this is visible now. Can, You're can good. anyone see? Okay. Yep. Thanks. So um, let's go through, and, and so first what I want to do is I want to start with the basic characteristics of, of human brains. And one of the things um, that, uh, uh, so basically there, there are three characteristics that human brains are superior in, uh, or we believe we're superior in, in uh, compared to most other things that we've seen, most other living things that we've seen. One is reasoning, and this we, you know, most humans pride ourselves in this. Um, and another way of thinking of reasoning or the more sophisticated forms of reasoning is it's actually an accurate way of predicting. And that's a very sophisticated model because to predict something, you have to understand it first. Um, you have to have an understanding of, you know, for example, if you're predicting when the sun will rise the next time, right, you have to understand that 
the sun follows cycles that you know you may have seen it you may have observed the sun rising every you know every uh you know few hours um, you know primitive uh animals and primitive men not primitive animal primitive primates and primitive uh humans had seen this the you know the sun rising periodically every uh you know we call, now we know it's 24 hours but at that time they didn't necessarily have numbers to count the number of hours and they didn't even have the concept of hours but they realized that um periodically the sun rose and by looking at that um they could basically figure out that you know after seeing it for hundreds of days let's say it, it was an established pattern so they can easily predict that since it's risen for the last hundred days it's very likely to, to the sun is very likely to rise again um Another aspect of reasoning is goal setting. And uh, we see this not only in humans, but we see this in, in, in many animals, especially primates and, and the more complicated, uh, higher uh, thinking mammals. Um, they set goals. So, for example, foraging for food, looking for food is a type of goal setting. You decide in your mind what you want to do. You want to look for food. Um, you plan how to do that. Um, if it's in a tree, then you have to climb that tree, or you may have to shake the tree, or you have to do something to make that food come to you, or you may go to the food and then execution. So you have to actually do something. You have to either go near uh, the food source. You may have to, um, you know, again, climb or, or shake a tree, something like that. So these are as all aspects of reasoning. Uh, another aspect of reasoning that we're familiar with is tool making. Um, we all, you know, humans make have, have made tools, you know, since our uh, early uh, years. Um, but also there are more sophisticated ty types of tool making, uh, for example, processes. Um, you can think of a recipe, you know, as a simple process, but processes can be more sophisticated. Um, another type of reasoning is the scientific uh, process or the scientific inquiry. Um, another type of reasoning is mathematics. These are all more, uh, uh, high, more uh, developed cognitively. Um, they are more um, symbolic. And therefore, they also give us more predictive power. Uh, for example, using mathematics, uh, the mathematics is used to model things that we've observed. So, for example, if we're looking at the sun falling and rising, um, through mathematics, we've developed simple numbers by that time. And so we may be able to count. We may be able to say from one sunrise to the next sunrise, we may divide that into a single day and divide that into hours. We might decide there are 10 hours or 100 hours. You know, we we today have 24 hours, but there's no real reason why it has to be 24 hours. It can be any uh, fixed number of hours that every day constitutes. And the mathematics then will be able to help us predict that exactly in, if we decide 100 hours de uh, determines a day, you know, the interval between two sunrises, then we can count the number of hours to the next day, and we can predict that in that 100th hour, the sun will rise again. And the next day in the hundredth hour again, it will rise again. So using simple mathematics, we can predict the sunrise fairly accurately. So mathematics and science give us more ability to predict, more precise ways of predicting. Um, also, um, our ontological existence. Um, we uh, now in neuroscience, there have been a lot of developments and, and findings where uh, it seems to be that religion is baked into our brains. A lot of the higher mammals and primates have uh, superstitious characteristics. Humans definitely do. Uh, so religion is a part of us. Um, philosophy is a more sophisticated outgrowth of that. And science, again, is, is emerging of those. And it's, again, uh, also you know, parallels those types of uh, processes. So reasoning in general is, is a very advanced type of behavior and, and characteristic that human brains have. Um, another area are emotions. Now, the way to think of emotions are, are bonds. We form bonds with uh, other animals, other people, but also with things. Um, so sophisticated relationships, that's in general what, what emotions uh, get, give us the ability to have. And one form of, of um, emotions is through our ability to communicate. Um, we use symbolic communication. Uh, many uh, of the uh, primates that we've uh, um, tried to teach language to also have been able to understand and learn simpler forms of communication, symbolic communication. So this is not unique to humans, but um, it's a more advanced form of communication than some of the more uh, simpler animals uh, exhibit. Um, and you know, the most advanced form of communication that we have today, or one of the most advanced, is the internet. 
So humans have developed many, many sophisticated tools, like communication tools, to help us to stay connected with other people and to uh, communicate how we feel, what we're thinking, um, and aspects of our reasoning. And, and these tools include language, you know, our spoken language, um, auditory, uh, written language, um, these things, even, even sign language and, and uh, um, you know, aspects of how our bodies move, the, you know, symbolic language. Another uh, area of uh, emotions is uh, in our ability to uh, have complex and dynamic social networks. And this is not only um, in advanced years, it's actually throughout our lives. Many animals have relationships and social networks, but many animals actually have them in the later stages of life. They have much simpler social networks, so they usually don't have social networks when they're very young. They're tied to a single adult or you know, one parent or two parents at most, and they don't interact much with other adults, whereas human babies can interact with, with you know, a, a fairly large, you know, five to 10 adults regularly and have unique interactions with all of those adults, um, distinct unique interactions with those adults and, and maintain those ties in, uh, in separate ways. Um, they can recognize uh, different adults, even from, from around six, six months of age. So um, human infants are unique in that way that we can start to form sophisticated relationships from fairly early on. Um, another aspect of emotions and bonds are in how we uh, do child rearing. We have much more sophisticated methods. And also, uh, we teach our children for over a decade, usually two decades. You know, this is one of the reasons why most human children are in school for until about the age of 20, um, because they are um, learning from adults, usually their parents, but also teachers. And this is more, this is not found in most other uh, species, biological systems, and this is unique to humans. Um, the ability to teach and the ability to rear our children for decades um, and pass on the collective knowledge that we have that we've gained as a species um, to uh, to our children. This this is a very sophisticated aspect of um, uh, of of our uh, uh, our future set. Um, and last is is what I'll call um, efficient survival, and this actually encapsulates a lot of things. And for those of you who may have been involved in in prior talks. These things, these three areas basically parallel different aspects of our brain physiology also. The, the lowest it corresponds to the, the, the uh, basal parts of our brain. The emotional centers correspond to the, to, to the medial um, and central parts of our brain. And the reasoning corresponds to the, to the cortex, the outer um, layer of our brain. Uh, this is a simple way to look at it, but it does uh, help us to explain. And this, this third area, efficient survival, is, is actually more than simply basic survival. It's, it's our ability as humans to, to master not only, our, not only our body, but the environments that we live in and basically the entire world. Um, and if you think about it, humans now today have mastered what we, what we say the world is actually uh, our solar system. We have been able to uh, uh, move throughout the solar system. We've been able to um, go deep in, into the uh, into the oceans, um, we can travel, uh, you know, across um, uh, vast, uh, 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 you know, regions of, of space, and uh, so these are, are examples of our ability to master the environment that we're in. Um, one of the things that we do that we've managed to to master, and which has actually given us more sophisticated brain, our brain has evolved because of the way that we manage energy, the energy that our body has, and the energy that we um, obtain from eating. So, you know, the simplest example of, of survival is what we do as far as food. Food is the most basic element of, of any organism's survival. Every organism needs energy to survive, uh, to survive on its own as the individual and also to procreate. And food is, uh, a, red, is a fuel, 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 fuel source which um, every organism has to search for and then consume and then digest and metabolize to keep itself going. And humans tend to spend fewer hours than most other animals in foraging food and eating food and chewing food because we have developed more sophisticated ways. For example, we cook our food, which actually breaks down the food biochemically. It breaks down the food prior to it even entering our mouth and it becomes easier for us to digest. Um, we use systems like farming 
to grow vast amounts of food, to grow food that is more nutritious for us rather than relying on, on uh, leaves and stems, which many other animals, um, or raw meat, which many other animals rely on. Um, most of the meat that we eat is, is pre-cooked, which again makes it more uh, easy to digest. We use refrigeration. There are many, many techniques that we've developed. Um, and again, these are all examples of our mastery of the world around us to help us survive. Um, controlling our environment and our world also has to do with, um, and again, uh, you know, many of these things can translate into energy. Um, so for example, shelter. We have sophisticated shelters which protect us from cold weather, very hot weather, from rain, from uh, snow, you know, from even from earthquakes, you could say, um, flooding, things like that. Um, we've managed to be able to um, obtain more energy from the sun, you know, solar uh, systems, from uh, fossil fuels, um, you know, from uh, hydrothermic, hydrothermal um, plants. We, we can obtain energy from our environment to help us survive, to help us live, to heat our homes and cool our homes and, and power our transportation systems. And we also have sophisticated transportation systems which help us to move. We no longer need to rely on our feet to, to move or, or, or crawling. Um, we can uh, ambulate across vast distances now very efficiently, relatively speaking. Um, so this is another aspect of how efficient we've become in, um, in terms of mastering and existing, um, operating within the world. Um, also, the, there's something, I've talked about this in the past, and even this, this slide you know, presents aspects of this, that we have multiple brains. The, the three regions that we have, in a simple sense, we can think of as three district brains. And um, biologically, this is true because if you look at the evolution of, of humans and evolution of, of all of our prior uh, species along, along the, the evolutionary tree, the different parts of our brain that we have did not just arise in humans. They, so for example, the brainstem has existed from pretty much the primordial forms of, of uh, the initial life, you know, the initial organisms that had uh, a brain. Um, they very early developed what we might call a brainstem. It was the neural cord originally, but that basically, and, and that in us, that separates into the brainstem and as well as our, our spinal cord. But the neural cord was the precursor to the brainstem and, and pretty much every um, organism um, above, uh, every multicellular um, organism has uh, some type of brainstem. And then more sophisticated animals, reptiles and, and, and uh, higher level than that, had developed the, this, uh, you know, what we call the limbic system in humans, that these are the emotional centers of the brain, but they don't have the, you know, the higher cortex. Most of the simpler animals don't have, um, you know, the higher level uh, uh, structures. And then we humans, we have a cortex, although some mammals also have uh, similar structures to what our, our neocortex is, um, but they're simpler and they are smaller in size in, in many other animals. So the multiple brains and multiple regions that we have is another aspect of human brains. Also, um, in humans, these regions actually operate simultaneously and they can act in both cooperative and um, uh, competitive means, uh, uh, which gives us much more complex behavior. So this is, these are other aspects of, of human, human behavior. Um, also, we have mastery over uh, energy and information. I'm not going to, go, going to go too much into this, but um, this is something I've talked about in the past, and then you know, I can go into it more if somebody has a question around it. But um, energy and information is the way I see uh, in my model of the universe. Energy and information is, is one of the fundamental things. And we have mastered that at all, at, at most levels that uh, we can experience in the world, from our ability to, to use space telescopes to peer back in time, in a sense. Um, our understanding of black holes, our understanding of biology and genetics, all of these things have to do with energy and information, and, and we've really mastered these areas. Um, not to say we've mastered them fully, you know, there are many areas we, each of these areas can extend further, and there are new areas that we need to, to master even more. But among all of the species on the Earth, we have um, one of the most sophisticated uh, understanding and, and control over uh, energy and information. So these are, in general, um, the types of characteristics in human brains that uh, make us superior to, to other animals. Um, another uh, few other things about uh, human brains is that our brains can learn and adapt. Um, this is uh, 
uh, important to emphasize. We, um, over, um, over years, uh, our brain changes uh, physically. Uh, for example, the uh, and, and again, in, in prior talks I've, I've gone into this, I'm not going to go into, go into, into detail on a lot of these issues, but um, the, the infant human brain um, actually is large, is, it has more neurons, but it has very few uh, connections, interconnections between those neurons. And as a child grows um, until about age seven, the number of neurons that it has reaches a maximum peak. And, and then it starts to shrink in terms of the number of neurons. Although physically it still continues to grow, the number of neurons and the density of neurons, uh, sorry, the number of neurons starts to decrease. Um, and the uh, number of network connections between those neurons starts to increase dramatically from that. And that also parallels the types of learning that we do because we're learning a tremendous amounts in the first few years. Um, and that parallels us. So the, our human brains have much more sophisticated physical changes and that especially the network, the network topology of our brain changes tremendously in the first few years of life and it continues to change into our, or into our mid twenties, um, and even beyond that. Uh, but most of the changes happen up to, up to around the, the second, uh, part of the, into the third decade. Another aspect of human brains, and this is not only human, but, uh, the, the extent to which we have neurotransmitters, neurochemicals, neuropeptides, many chemical signaling molecules that we have are much more than that are present in many other animals. Um, in primates, they have similar numbers, but in many mammals, they're, they're fewer and um, simpler. Um, although they, they have um, some of the uh, uh, neurotransmitters that we have um, uh, do multiple functions, or in some of them they don't have. So um, because of the number uh, because of the sophistication of them, because of the um, what I'm calling cycles, basically there are um, you can think of them as feedback loops that are built into our brain as it develops and grows and learns. These give much more sophisticated abilities to to human brains. And again, these are also part of animal brains, but they're to a somewhat less level. Um, our brain also is compartmentalized, um, and you know I talked about three of these main compartments, but if you think of the cortex, you know, we, we think of um, in, in uh, contemporary neuroscience, the simple view of, of a brain is as four different lobes. Actually, the more sophisticated model has, um, it's, it's over 100 different sections of the brain that, that we found. Uh, a few years ago, there was a, a study which tried to find distinct regions of the brain which uh, seem to characterize um, uh, morphologically and, and functionally different um, uh, areas of the brain, and we found it was over 200 different regions. Um, so our brain is highly compartmentalized, not, not to say that each of those regions do something fully by themselves. Most of these compartmentalized regions have to cooperate with uh, other regions. They, they operate as a network of, of compartmentalized regions. That's what gives us sophisticated behavior. But the fact that we have these compartmental uh, regions uh, in, in the two hemispheres um, gives us much more sophisticated. For example, in, in humans and, and many uh, many mammals, actually, um, we have what's known as a, a fusiform facial area, uh, fusif fusiform facial gyrus, which which is slightly behind our ear, um, and and that's a very very small area of the brain, but its sole function is to recognize what we call a face. You know, when we look at a smiley face, two eyes, a nose, maybe a, a mouth. Um, that ability to recognize something like a smiley face, and, and we can see it on a piece of toast or in a cloud floating in the sky. That ability to recognize that is a tiny, tiny region of the brain, less smaller than a pea, um, and we have two of them in, in each hemisphere, and many mammals have, have uh, similar corresponding structures located slightly differently, but they have the same. So these compartmentalized um, uh, feature sets are, are, give us much more sophisticated behavior. Um, our brain, human brains are, are able to adapt to the information over the years. You know, we, we learn over the years and over the years we learn using different types of information. Um, when we're young, we learn using mostly um, visual and audio information. But as we grow older, we start to learn using symbolic information. For example, a, an infant doesn't really think of the world in terms of language, in terms of words. They don't have the concept of word, even though they may start to recognize what the sound 
corresponds to an object, for example, an apple or a spoon. They may recognize that the sound corresponds to a physical spoon. They don't have the idea that a spoon is consist consists of a word which has spelling or symbology. They don't understand that. But by the age of five or, or seven, most children have learned that a lot of our ideas are tokenized in symbols, include not, not simply words, but all, not simply um, audio sounds, but also written um, textual form. And also we have a, and, and as, as they grow older, as children grow older into their late teens, they start to form the ability to have more complex ideas, theoretical ideas. For example, they can, um, you know, children start to understand that there's such a thing as vapor. You can't see vapor, you can't feel vapor, but it's a conceptual thing that, you know, after a certain age and with a certain amount of sophistication, you can start to understand that there are gaseous objects in the world. And this is why those those subjects are taught in the later years and in, in either ju late junior high or, or, or high school years, because that's the amount of time that the physical brain and, and humans need to develop to a certain point, as well as our language skills need to develop up to a certain point so that we can start to um, manipulate these ideas, the idea of a, of a vapor, of a gaseous uh, molecular cloud, which we cannot see, we cannot feel or touch, but it's a fully, fully conceptualized a notion that we hold in our brain and we can manipulate it. We can, we can imagine a cloud floating in the air um, and we can understand that that cloud is made up of water molecules. That those are, are more sophisticated forms of, of information processing. And at the same time, we can, as we grow older, what happens is we have to deal with more conflicting forms of information. Um, and we're able to do that. Um, we're able to do that more sophisticated in more sophisticated ways. And, and some of that is actually done at a biological level. It's, it's done at a primitive biological level. Um, I'm not going to go into this too much tonight, but it's done at a, it doesn't really require um, reasoning or, or abstract thought. It, it actually happens in, it, because of the design, because of the structures of our brain, um, it happens, I, I don't want to say automatically, but it happens much more simply and automatically than originally we, we, had, we had thought. So, um, Anyway, so and then the last um, I'm going to touch on right now is uh, as far as learning and adaptation, our learning ability to learn and adapt uh, increases exponentially over time. This is one of the, again a reason why in our schooling we uh, our school, we used to have schooling for so, such a long period of time, and why we have such sophisticated levels of knowledge that we're passing on to children, um, you know, from you know early years to, to high school and then to college and then to you know, graduate studies, you know, postdoc, etc. They're, they're very, very, um, the ability for a typical uh, human uh, to, to learn using language and symbols is, is very sophisticated. Um, and, and so these are all aspects of, of characteristics of human brains. Um, now, something that um, I think needs to be emphasized here is that all of the things that I've mentioned in this slide and the prior slide are actually also characteristics of animal brains. These are not simply characteristics of human brains. The difference is in the, the degree, you might say, both the, the breadth and the depth of each of these characteristics, they all exist in animal brains, but they exist to lesser levels. So this is an idea that I want to present, which is very important um, because after we, when, when we begin to understand this, we can start to understand what makes our brain unique. Um, and then we can start to ask the question, how unique is our brain? Or is our brain unique enough? Or, or is our brain um, uh, unique enough that uh, you know, there could be nothing else like it? Um, now, one of the things that, so here, here's a simple model of, of our brain. Uh, again, from the first slide, um, three different areas that, we, that our brain deals with. And again, these are all uh, also in animals. Reasoning, uh, what I call meta-awareness. And meta-awareness is actually a more complicated way of talking about all of these aspects of survival that's built into our brain. Our brain is a survival machine. That's what it is fundamentally. It is the one organ that keeps us alive, literally and figuratively, it keeps us alive in every sense of the word. Um, our heart keeps us alive in terms of uh, providing blood, providing nutrients, providing cooling, you know, many of these aspects. But our heart cannot get us away from danger because our heart a heart basically only pumps blood inside our body. Our heart cannot move our legs. Our heart cannot control our eyes. 
all that the heart can do is is physiologically support the rest of our body and our brain. So the heart is not uh, sufficient to keep us alive. And similarly, if you look at any of our other organs, none of those organs alone can keep us alive. Now the brain is one of the few organs that can actually keep us alive for a short period of time after all of our other organs have perished or, or have ceased to function or they have reduced capacity. For example, if you have, if you're in a place where you can't breathe and your heart has stopped pumping, let's say for, for you know, a few seconds, your brain will continue to operate for maybe 10 or 20 seconds and you will pass out eventually because the brain needs nutrient nutrition just as every other organ does. But the brain can, can operate without, basically what, what, what that means is the brain can operate without those other organs. Um, it, it basically needs fuel, um, um, and and that's the reason why you know our, our lungs and our heart and and everything else has to be there because those other organs are there to provide energy, constant source of energy for our brain because our brain is trying to help us navigate in the world, survive and flourish in the world. So these three areas: meta awareness, emotions, and reasoning, are three ways of looking at um, human brain and again also animal brains, and these three areas communicate with each other and a simple way of explaining this is using these three words sensitivity culture and systemic view um, the the link between reasoning and emotions i'm describing as what constitutes culture uh, i'm not going to go in detail into these i might go into these expand on these in, in a, a future talk but i just want to introduce this idea right now um, so reasoning emotions um, they, they form the basis of what we call culture um, Meta-awareness and emotions form the basis of what I'm calling sensitivity. Sensitivity is our ability to um, sense things, sense not only physical things, but also sense emotions. Um, so sensitivity of what's happening in the world around us. And this gives us the ability to have relations. For example, to have a relationship, you have to be able to sense what is happening in another person, or you have to be able to sense the weather outside. Is it weather going to be uh, fortuitous or is it going to be dangerous? So these are all things that, that have to do with, with sensitivity. And the systemic view is a little more complicated, but it, it, it ties in our ability to reason with our ability to interact with the world, internal world and external world. And it gives us a systemic view of the universe that we operate in. And one of the things that this gives us is, um, and I believe um, this presents an aspect of consciousness. In the middle of this slide, you'll see the word consciousness. And consciousness really is, is a combination of all of these things. But the systemic view is vital in this because the systemic view is one of those areas that many other animals don't have, or they have a much smaller aspect of that. The other two or the other one, pretty much all other animals have, but systemic view, meaning the time of meta-awareness and reasoning is unique to humans or unique to the primates. And that, and, and that element is actually more important for the higher levels of consciousness. And again, consciousness, I've talked about this in prior talks, where consciousness is not a homogeneous thing. Most people think of it as, as either all or nothing or, or this one thing. But a more sophisticated version of consciousness is that consciousness entails many different types of behaviors. Um, for example, the simplest level of consciousness is whether you're physically conscious or not, whether you're awake or not, whether you're comatose or out of comatose. That's the simplest level of consciousness that we know of. The more, more sophisticated ways of consciousness is where what we call meta-consciousness, or are you aware of your own mind being a mind, thinking about itself thinking? That's sophisticated behavior. And we don't believe animals, they, they can do some of that, but not to the level that we can. We can philosophize, um, we can imagine ourselves um, in the future thinking about something that another person um, might do that another person did in the past. Those are very complicated ways of thinking about um, the world, about other people, about us, about consciousness. So these are all complicated ideas. But systemic view um, gives us the ability. And what, just to, to give a little bit of an understanding of systemic, what I mean by systemic view is this entails many, many advanced concepts in, in human behavior. For example, the, way, the, the, the fact that we measure things. Um, what measuring is, is that we are observing the universe, the world around us. We are recognizing, we are being aware of things in the world, and we are measuring them in specific ways. We're quantifying them and using reason to quantify them. And so the qu concept of quantification is one example of a systemic view. That when we quant, and the example I gave earlier 
that we have sunrises and we have days, we have solar cycles. This is a form of a systemic view. Um, and probably um, primates have a sense of that because they see the sun rising every day and they recognize it, but their systemic view is at a much lower level than our version of systemic view of, of a sunrise of, of, a, of a calendar, of a day-night cycle. Animals, you know, higher animals, mammals also recognize day-night cycles, but they don't think of it, they don't have a calendar. We don't believe they have, they don't have a calendar system in mind where they realize that this is the winter and therefore we have two months, two more months after which we might have spring. Um, that's a more sophisticated type of systemic view of the world. Um, so again, this, this, all of these things are presenting characteristics of the human brain. And, and again, most of these things, or actually I'm going to say all of these things also exist in animal brains, especially in, in the more uh, higher mammals and definitely in many of the primates that we've studied. But the, that aspect of consciousness is the one area which really divides us from a lot of animals. But, every, but even consciousness, animals have consciousness. That's something even, even lower forms of animals have the lowest forms of consciousness. For example, an ant or a spider literally can lose consciousness. So that type of consciousness exists in, in most animals, even though we don't, uh, you know, most people don't think of that as consciousness, it actually is. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, they, in, in these talks, I've tried to present this more sophisticated view of consciousness, uh, because this helps us to understand, um, you know, our brain and, 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 uh, and, and life in general. So um, let me, um, Actually, let, let's let's do this. Let's let's pause for a few minutes, and I'm going to take some questions. Um, let me stop the slide here, and let's do some question and answer. If anybody has any Q questions at this point, so folks, go ahead and type exclamation point in the chat, or uh, raise your hand in Zoom in order to ask Sanjay a question. Uh, so first up, we have Laura. Uh, I think you're muted, Laura. I think you. Oh, uh, you're still you're muted, Laura. Laura. All right. Um, what we'll do is until. Are you on? All right, Sanjay. When I was um, an older graduate student, undergraduate student at the ripe age of like maybe 27, and I wanted a major in math, the attitude was, was I was too old because, you know, to be able to study math, you have to be young because beyond 2021, 20, you are finished. So, True or false? I'd say false, but no. But but what? What's true and what's not? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, learning we can do humans we can do it at at uh, almost any age, any older age. I mean, very young children can't learn very sophisticated concepts, obviously. But as we age, we have more ability to learn. Um, and I disagree with that, that notion. I mean, yes, the educational system did have limits. I think that may also have been sexism built into education um, in, you know, several decades ago. So, um, yeah, I agree. That's, that's an unfortunate situation. Sexism, but that was sort of still, that was for guys and male and female, but female worse, I guess. But yeah, no, I think it, it was, a, I don't know. I think it was just something that was built into an, an egocentric kind of group of people who, you know, felt that, felt whatever they felt, but I think it was wrong and I agree now this was, you know, truth to the point. Um, and they let me take okay. courses anyway, even though I was old and so forth. And, you know, but Good, thank you. There's a fight to be had. Thank you, Laura. Uh, next up, we have Ian. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, it was a problem unmuting. Uh, a case, uh, two questions. Uh, 
briefly the calendar sense that Sanjay uh, talked about seems to be basically a specific case of the general uh, inductive reasoning ability, it would seem. And uh, as regard to uh, this calendar and time sense, one might hypothesize that uh, migratory birds at least might have it since you would think that their existence, their migration would depend upon maybe inferring seasons from outside queue, so to speak. Uh, and apart from that, uh, I recall reading somewhere that uh, that uh, human brain relative to brains of other mammals had a specific strategy of uh, uh, basically uh, uh, favoring growing more synapses vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis learning and the like, whereas other, where say the brains of rodents, as I recall some article claiming Instead of growing more synapses, they tended to uh, the neurons tended to enlarge, and basically, synapses versus enlargement was attributed to uh, much of human cognitive ability. If so, uh, can we speculate about other animals? Well, there are a few other animals uh, which seem to have uh, learning abilities and some reasoning abilities. Reasoning abilities, not as, as sophisticated as humans, but more sophisticated than most other animals like cephalopods, octopi, or whales, or, or elephants or the like. Uh, might we speculate that to some extent uh, there are uh, neurological structures either at the gross or fine level that uh, overlap more, that correspond to those in, in humans underlie their reasoning abilities, so. Yeah, I mean, so, um... I mean, what you earlier originally said about calendars, um, encoding of calendars in, into the brain. I mean, many, many animals, even we have in a, in a very loose sense, we have an encoding of, of day night cycles and calendars in our brain, but um, uh, they're much simpler than, than uh, the sophisticated understanding we have of, of a true calendar, of a calendar with 365.24, you know, et cetera, days. Um, that is uh, unique to humans. But yes, the the encoding of these structures in many animals are at a biological level, whereas for us, it's at an information level. It's, it's a different type of encoding. Um, although biological encoding still encodes information, but um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's encoded at a different density of information. We, we need to use a lot more information to encode. We have a lot more sophisticated understanding of calendars. Therefore, there's a lot more information in our understanding of what a calendar uh, is comprised of. Um, as far as the, the learning and reasoning abilities of various animals, there, there is a, you know, definitely there, there are, um, uh, there's a, a, a gradient, almost, you know, you can think of it as a spectrum, you know, a, a gradu graduation of increasing ability across animals. Um, in, in, um, currently, the, the, the consensus, not, I don't want to say consensus, but, but there, there's a strong belief among Many scientists that um, corvids, um, birds um, similar to, to um, ravens and crows, um, corvids are some of the most intelligent animals that we know of, um, and they are uh, corvids, um, uh, dolphins, um, uh, chimpanzees. These are actually very similar to each other in terms of the level of intelligence, at least at the adult stage level of intelligence that they have. And it's been measured um, in several studies. The approximate relative intelligence of an adult corvid um, has been measured to be equivalent to around a seven-year-old human child. So that's pretty sophisticated. If you think about what a seven-year-old human child can do in terms of reasoning, in terms of mathematical problem solving, they've done experiments and corvids have been able to solve and do sophisticated reasoning. Not, not just, the, you know, you may have seen videos and read stories about corvids dropping stones into a tank of water. Those are the most simplest forms of reasoning, but they can do much more sophisticated forms of reasoning than that. You can, you can uh, multiply to two or three levels of sophistication, where not only do they have to drop stones into a, into a container, but they also have to push something else after they drop four stones, but before they drop too many stones. So their level of understanding of, of something in their environment, you know, again, that's what the brain is, is, is best at. That's what's there in all animals, is to help us to navigate the environment that we live in. And corvids 
can do that to a sophisticated, very sophisticated level also. Um, so yeah, I agree that that there is a you know a animals approach um, certain human capabilities. It's it's phenomenal if you really uh, look look at some of this the work. Thanks, Ian. Um, do we have anyone else? I, I, I just uh, wanted to do Q and A so that if there's any questions, you know, we can get through those right now so that I can continue. I, I don't want to have too many questions at the end, so that's why I wanted to. Um, sure. Uh, so, David, uh, do you want to come off mute and actually ask your question? You had asked a question earlier. Or I but, well, I just think that in, I, I, I was observing that the, the the concept that there is a continuum of intelligence from less intelligent animals to more intelligent animals, you know, up through like a seven year old child there where there's some overlap and then you get into adult intelligence, I think is just not, that's just not really, um, I, I, it, it's not, it doesn't match with observable reality, right? We don't see, there are, there are some seven year olds who, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, shouldn't happen to any of us, but who are, who are retarded. And even they at age seven can, maybe do some aspects of dressing themselves and can speak or at least understand fluent, you know, uh, language. And I'm not talking about recognizing of, you know, um, a small uh, set of, 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 of uh, tones or words or uh, images, but actually like full blown spoken speech. I mean, the there, there. You could say that there's a continuum, but there's just there's sort of a from the end of the animal, highest animal intelligence to the lowest human intelligence is such a vast gulf. It's um, it's like a continuum from a from so, a different arc. So, okay. Uh, do you want to comment there, Sandra? Um, I mean, I, I, I can explain what um, what, you're, what David said, but it, it's not completely. You see, when you when you look at be, human behavior, um, a lot of our behavior has to do with socialization. So, the example you gave with a human child dressing themselves, if you compare a human child which has not grown up in civilization, that human child will not be able to dress themselves, no matter they have the same intelligent brain, but they will not be able to dress themselves because but this, dressing, the same also goes for a cat well, right. or a or a dolphin, so, if they were raised in a human society, they still, we haven't found one that can dress themselves. So, so the, the parallel is that if you have certain animals who are taught language, um, they can learn language, human type language, sign, there, there are some um, uh, apes which have been taught human sign language, literally human sign language, they, their vocabulary is not large. Again, the limitation, one, one thing that we have to, and I didn't go into this too much, and this is one of the difficulties in, in these types of talks is that people extrapolate ideas into many different areas, the areas that, I, that science doesn't go into and, and, and I haven't mentioned. I'm not saying that there's a continuous uh, spectrum. What I'm saying is that there is a gradient. Gradient doesn't mean that along every level of that you will find an animal that matches or that's a continuous range. What it means is that from the lowest to the highest, you, you will be able to place animals and the animals may um, propagate in clusters along that continuum. That doesn't mean the continuum is continuous. That's one aspect. And again, th these are things that, that I don't want to go into detail with because they're, you know, the things that I'm talking about, we have to be careful not to extrapolate too much into that. I mean, if when I say continuum, I didn't say it's a continuous continuum. It's a continuum simply means there's a broad range and it starts from lesser and goes up to higher. Um, and, and there is clustering across the many species of animals. Um, but even there, um, and when we look at the highest level of intelligence, uh, corvids, chimpanzees, their behavior, um, and again, if you want to use a lot of human characteristics, like wearing clothes or, or, or more sophisticated language, you can't really compare it that way. That's not a, a fair comparison because humans are, we have so many more elements. This is one of the things I'm, I'm not going to go in detail, but I'm going to mention in a future slide, is that the way we, and, and one of the things that I mentioned in, in prior slide is that we spent two decades teaching our children. And the extent of that 
that the amount of, of care and sophisticated time that we spend on our children actually provides a lot of the, the development in our brains that we see. Now, biologically, our brains are not multiple orders of magnitude more complicated than a chimpanzee's brain. Okay. In terms of the orders of magnitude difference between a chimpanzee's brain and a human brain, it's, let's say, 100 times as complicated. But the types of behaviors we can get from a human brain is thousands of times more complicated because that 100 time difference, 100 times difference is magnified and amplified because we are able to spend so much time teaching and honing skills in, in a human child that we can't do. And, and the human child doesn't reach the maximum limit of their brain capacity at the age of seven. They can go further. So the brain does not saturate at the age of seven, whereas a, a chimp's brain may start to saturate comparable to a seven-year-old's brain because physically the brain is not as sophisticated as our brain. That's something to understand. But basically, that's the idea is, is still correct, that there is a, a, a gradient of intelligence among animals and humans. Um, and that's the important idea that I, I think uh, we should we should take. OK, thank you. And uh, now, next up, we have Vanessa. OK, there's some, if they're like really critical to their behavior, I'm thinking like birds of prey, especially hawks. There'll be a morning where you'll see them all over the trees, not even getting up in the air, maybe later on the afternoon, where whether they've learned from experience that there's really not much of a draft for them to, you know, to glide around because they can go hours without flapping the wings. I mean, rarely do you see that happen. You know, whether that's something they've learned from experience, you know, it's kind of hard to pass that down. But, you know, to see tons of them, not a single one flying versus, OK, I only saw one today and the rest of you either maybe had enough in their belly. Can that also be dependent, I guess, on what the, you know the need for it is? You know, they're not just flying to have a vacation and you know sightseeing. Yeah. So the example you gave with gliding um, in, in birds, that's uh, I don't I wouldn't consider that as as forms of intelligence. Um, it's not that they're thinking about gliding or that they're um, you know, studying the aerodynamics and airflow and, and, and the, uh, you know, the characteristics of their wings, they're not doing any of that. Um, it's intuitive knowledge that they've, they've learned um, from a young age. Oh, but uh, Sanjay, what I was saying, the fact that they know that this is not conducive, like, you know, there'll, there'll be the thing where there's hardly any wind and like in various uh, levels of the atmosphere. So it would be kind of a stupid for them to do so, that whether they realize, okay, today is not the day to go hunting because maybe that I, I can't simply glide and focus, you know, my energy either on looking for the prey uh, to feed okay, my family. Thank, thank you, yeah. Vanessa. Right, yeah, that, that's similar to the meta-awareness idea that I, that I talked about. That's an aspect of meta-awareness of the environment. They're, they're much more aware of the environment in, in the sky, in the air, yeah. Um, actually, I, I have a brief question and just maybe clarification for that when you were talking about meta awareness. Um, you talked about what it means to be self aware. And I was wondering if actually you could expand on that a little bit. Um, because that you had that under the category of meta awareness as well. Okay, yeah, so so I mean, meta awareness is is so it starts off with the concept of awareness. Okay, that's the fundamental in, in this that uh, every organism is aware of its environment in one way or another. Um, ants have antennae which act as, as both a nose and an ear, um, and, and that helps them to, to look at chemicals floating in the air as well as vibrations in the air. Um, and that gives us them awareness of you know, either predators or food or different types of things around them. Um, we have similar structures, our nose and our ears, even our skin to some extent provides similar um, uh, uh, information from, from the environment. Uh, but so meta awareness is at the minimum awareness of the environment, awareness of our internal states, but it's much more than that. It's, it's as though the part of meta expands exponentially into many, many more sophisticated parts of behavior. Um, so conscious, those areas that, that we attribute to human consciousness are all um, aspects of meta-awareness. Um, they're, they're not only in meta-awareness, they're also in reasoning, because that's why I tied reasoning and meta-awareness together. 
but awareness is um, so you know for example when I talk about awareness awareness of ourselves we would call that self-awareness but there are many types of self-awareness there's self-awareness of the physiological um, information within our body whether we have pain in our body whether we have a gurgling sensation in our stomach um, you know something like that these are, are our temperature uh, body temperature these are all types of self-awareness but there's also self-awareness uh, around our cognitive state um, am I happy Am I nervous? You know, these are all also aspects of meta-awareness. So all of these things fall under this umbrella of meta-awareness. Okay, so uh, we have Ian Fawn. Or actually, I'll go with Ella first, and then Ian, you can, since you already asked a question, we'll come back to Ian. Um, <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, Sanjay, thank you for uh, speaking with us again. I have a question about a general question at a very about a very complex topic. So with quantum mechanics and what we what we've learned, um, is it possible at the quantum level, the brain consciousness is affected or interacts in any way instead of in terms of its function, and, you know, I'm just thinking, I guess the core idea in classic physics was to describe the world out there with no reference to our thoughts, which are in here. So since the science is changing, is, you know, is there, is there a possibility that quantum mechanics is is being used in any way in the area of neuroscience and research? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, interesting question. So, um, and and <laughs> this question definitely will come up at least um, since the last few years for any discussion of consciousness. And most neuroscientists don't uh, believe so. Um, most physicists who have started to go into the area of neuroscience, although they're not in the area of neuroscience, but they're looking at consciousness. Many physicists, not all, many physicists have talked about quantum effects possibly being the basis around consciousness. And, and so there's a disparity here. Um, I, and, and, and one of the, the difficulties in this is that a lot of those physicists have not looked at the uh, the vast amounts of research that have been done for decades that disprove a lot of the notions that um, embody this, this quantum uh, description of consciousness. Um, for example, Penrose recently, he, he described microtubules um, as possibly being um, uh, implicated or, or uh, contributory um, in consciousness. Uh, microtubules are large molecules. Um, quantum effects don't occur at that size. Quantum effects occur at much smaller levels. Um, I'm surprised that he, he's mentioned that. Um, he may not realize how large um, microtubules are, but um, anyway, um, I, I don't believe that quantum effects are the primary basis for, uh, for consciousness. I don't believe they're, they're uh, uh, really involved at all. But I will leave open the possibility that there may be some contributions from them. Although, to me personally, it's too complicated a way to look at things because consciousness can be explained, at least in, in, in uh, contemporary neuroscience, it can be explained, or aspects of it can be explained more simply rather than having to go down to a quantum level. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't want to say it isn't. I personally don't believe it isn't. Um, the answer has not been answered yet even in neurosciences, but um, many neuroscientists don't believe that um, quantum effects uh, contribute to um, most of consciousness. Good, good question, thanks. Ian, uh, would you like to follow, ask a follow-up question? Yes, uh, you spoke much, Sanjay, about the interact, interplay of uh, child rearing conditions on, uh, on ped pediatric and adolescent neurological development. I have a speculative question based upon that. I call it reading uh, recently that uh, that uh, all of us have this period during a very young childhood 
of this amnesiac period, which is attributed to the fact that at the very beginning, uh, during a, uh, the fetal stage in very early infancy, there is this astronomic, astronomically explosive growth of synaptic connections, so it's explosive synapsis. But however, beyond that, some period in, some period in early childhood, there is equally, equally dramatic uh, pruning, selective pruning of many of these uh, synaptic connections. Uh, and this pruning is uh, hypothesized to underlie this amnesiac period where basically it seems that at age three or four, whatever, uh, if we were to communicate with a child, they would seem to be aware they're shouting. Yet, yet in looking back, of, back on that period, most of us draw a blank, that amnesiac period, which again, some hypothesize to be uh, attributed to that massive synaptic pruning. Uh, now, is there any evidence that perhaps uh, certain, uh, so we say the child rearing conditions, the environmental conditions, can modulate the pruning at all? And if so, can this modulate uh, the various mental aptitudes of uh, of the of the kid, such as a uh, IQ or uh, or seemingly innate talent, interest, or personality factors, or like? Yeah, this is a, a good question. Um, this uh, gets into, so the early development of, of any organism's brain is very, very important to what happens, what its abilities throughout its life. Um, in humans, uh, I mean, what, what you described as far as the explosive growth, um, not only of synapses, but dendrites of, of neurons in general, of, of, of the entire, um, uh, um, you know, the, the biome of, of the brain, every type of cell, every type of structure in the brain um, amplifies and grows in human brains, but also in many animal brains. Um, and uh, this pruning is uh, characteristic of many of the, the higher animals, um, but especially in humans, because um, and, and we're not sure exactly why, but, you know, there are various theories around it. Um, so the, the question you're asking is, can environmental conditions affect this pruning? Can it modulate this pruning? I think that's what you're, what you're asking. And the quick answer is yes. For example, um, that's basically what epigenetics, that's one example, epigenetics helps do that um, because epigenetics affects um, at every level of neuronal um, growth and, and function. So for example, when uh, in, in a synapse, um, the, um, when the uh, vesicles that, uh, emit uh, um, neurotransmitters. Um, the number of vesicles that are generated by a specific neuron um, can be affected by epigenetics. So therefore, if because of epigenetic changes in the environment of that infant, um, which can cause changes in many neurons in that infant and the synapses of those neurons in that infant, which can cause it to, uh, uh, to develop in a way that it would for the rest of the life of that neuron, it would transmit more of a specific type of neurotransmitter or less, right? So either more or less of a neurotransmitter, then that infant's brain will become programmed to either have more or less of, of that neurotransmitter from that category, from that class of, of neuron. Um, and that might form the basis of, for example, um, a advanced function of the brain, it might give special abilities to that child, or it might give deficits to that child, depending on exactly what's changing in the, in the neuron and which neurons are affected. So yes, definitely environment can, can, does change um, and it can cause, um, cause these things. Excellent question, yeah. Okay. I'm not gonna yes, go too sir. much into it, I, you know, but th th these questions, I mean, we might have to do another talk later about just Q and A, we did that a few, a few, uh, months ago, but yeah, that was a really good question. I like that question. Yeah, there's a lot more I can go into, but I don't want to spend too much time right now. I want to go back to the, to the slides. Okay. All right. Well, with that, uh, why don't we head back to the slides uh, and start the second part of the presentation? All right. Um, so let me, um, yeah, let me start uh, sharing. It should be visible now. So, um, the next part, I'm going to talk about where animal brains mimic a child's brain. Um, 
and again, I'm not going to go in detail with, with these. The, these are very, uh, so developmentally, um, the, the brain uh, is basically fully formed at birth um, in most animals. Um, in humans, actually, it takes longer. In, in humans, it's not 100% formed. But in many animals, it's, it's in the late 90 percentile that it's formed. It, it, there's very little development that still is, main, uh, is required in most animal brains because many animals, especially many mammals, and even the, the simpler animals, after birth, they need to basically start functioning. They need to survive on their own. Um, they don't have social networks. They don't have a parent that stays with them. Um, so they have to basically start foraging and, and finding food on their own. They have to be almost fully functional. Um, from the time of birth. And that's one of the reasons why the brain in most animals are close to being fully formed, fully developed um, at birth. In humans, they are very close to, but they're much less formed than other animals. They're, you might say they're in the 90% uh, form. I mean, I don't want to give an exact number, but um, they are less formed than, than most animals. And they continue, and this is what, what I said earlier, that human children's brains continue growing until around age six to eight average around age seven, they continue to physically growing. Um, that's one of the reasons. Um, and um, so, so that's one aspect developmentally, um, but all animals, um, you know, including humans, our brain is more or less developed by the time we're born. It's not that human brains are 50% developed and 50% they develop after birth. It's not like that. They're, they're close to being fully developed at birth. And again, that is because of the way evolution genetics happens. That, we evolved from primates whose brains have um, uh, are, are close to being fully developed at birth. And we uh, evolutionarily are not that distant from, from chimps. We're basically uh, about a million to two, two million years um, uh, separated from them, which is in terms of evolutionary time, which goes back to 400, 500 million, million years. That's a tiny fraction. So we're very close to, to most animals. And that's why our brain is also similar in that sense. Um, we, we also, um, developmentally, um, we um, and all animals learn by, or I should say all mammals learn by watching. Um, we watch uh, other animals. We watch our uh, peers, so other, other uh, animals of our own species, as well as uh, the higher forms of mammals, and especially primates, also learn by watching their parents. And um, there's been a lot of research done with specific types of primates and in orangutans, uh, in uh, chimpanzees, definitely in many types of apes, uh, gray apes. The, the, we have found that the infants um, will uh, stay with their parents for several years. And there are specific moments in every day or, or you know, let's say during a week where the parents are doing an activity, for example, um, they may be taking a nut and, and using a stone to crack the nut. And the infant apes hang around the parent and watch, very carefully observe, and then they'll go and find a nut themselves and try to duplicate the same behavior, and it won't work because they're not good at it. And they'll go back to the parent and watch again. And the parent actually engages in this. They don't help the child. They don't give the food to the child. So they're not, so this is very specific. This is only watching. We're not, we're not, uh, and, and humans do similar things in that we will demonstrate things. We will guide our children um, through watching. So watching is a very important aspect that is uh, that proliferates through many types of animals, especially the higher um, uh, mammals. Um, also, um, this third bullet, the smarter animal, higher mammals and especially primates have a longer learning period that they stay with their parents. Um, this is also characteristic. So developmentally, um, animal brains do mimic a child's brain. Morphologically, topologically, the connections, the neural connections that form in our brains. Um, we, again, um, animals have less neural, animals and infants have less neuronal connections early on. And those neuronal connections increase over time. That's similar. Um, and the, the, while the rate of growth of neuronal connections varies from animal to animal, and compared to humans, they, they vary. But this general trend is, is seen across most of the animal kingdom and um, in humans. And another aspect of that is the smarter animals 
I talked about corvids, I talked about chimpanzees, dolphins, etc., even elephants. Um, the smarter animals have a seminal, similar neuronal density, not the number of neurons, but the density of neurons. And that's another characteristic. I'm not going to go into what makes animal brain, what makes an animal brain smart, similar to human brain. That's not the topic tonight. But there are many things that we know that um, a lot of these smart animals, they share certain characteristics with human brains, especially human children's brains. Um, and that's, that's the point I'm trying to make here is that there are similarities in a lot of these animal brains as they develop from infancy into, into adulthood that matches the development of a human child's uh, brain's development. Um, and, and the structures in an animal brain and a child's brain, as well as some of the neurochemistry, are similar. Not the same, they're similar. They have parallels. They're simplified versions of them. But we can see, we can extrapolate that there are parallels. And the, extra, and, and the similarity is limited because of, because of genetics. They don't have the DNA. Their DNA has not evolved in the way that our DNA has evolved. So that's why they, they don't do that. It's not that they can't. If their DNA, I suspect, and then this is actually one of the things that I have here, um, in the comparative uh, the last example is that some animal brains have abilities of three to five year old humans. And I, I described that the most intelligent animals that we found come close to a seven year old child. And I'm not saying they match every behavior that a seven year old child exhibits. That's not the point. The point is that some of the very sophisticated behaviors that a seven-year-old child can do, that an average seven-year-old child can do, an average intelligent corvid, or one of the more intelligent corvids, can replicate a lot of those um, high intelligent characteristics of a seven-year-old child. Um, and many corvids and many younger uh, um, animals um, can mimic what a three-year-old human child can do. So again, this, this um, gradient of behaviors is there. The ability of um, behaviors in animals um, is there, and it matches what we see in human children. Now, the last bullet here is a hypothesis that, I, that I'm making, um, is that uh, when I was talking earlier about genetics, that the animals that we have today, it's very possible, it may be possible, that if they continue to evolve, and remember, evolution has to do a lot with the environment in which they evolve in. It's not simply that, that you evolve, you know, because they may evolve in a different environment than the environment that humans evolved in. But even if the environment that they evolve in is different, for example, a, a dolphin is going to evolve in an environment that's different from humans because they're in an aquatic environment where it's very, the world is very different. But if they have enough evolutionary pressure and survival pressure on them, they may be able to evolve in similar ways, not, not the exact same, but, but their brains may be able to evolve in ways to gain similar abilities, not structures, but abilities of their brain um, because of the pressure for them, survival pressure on their brain, um, if it's enough. Again, remember, evolution is a response to survival, it is a response to evolution, it is, is a response to environmental pressure. And the outcome is through mutations um, is a advancement of its capabilities, including brain capabilities. So I suspect that, um, and I think it's fairly easy to, to make this, this uh, claim, that animals may evolve given um, adequate uh, environments to also gain um, uh, brain uh, capabilities similar to humans, but it, it probably will take a long time. Humans, we evolve these in about 2 million years, in many animals, it may take longer because the environment that they live in, for example, dolphins, they don't live in the same type of environment. So in an aquatic environment, the pressures will not um, exert on them in, in a similar way. So it may take longer. So anyway, um, now I want to go into the aspect of AI. And this is, so what we've talked about so far is human brain, human behavior, human characteristics. And I've uh, um, dovetailed into that animals, animal brain, animal functions and features, and there are parallels. And they tend to mimic and follow the same trend line um, that human evolution has, has given us. Now, artificial intelligence is a completely different type of system. But artificial intelligence, let me just explain one thing about artificial intelligence is that I'm talking about neural network based artificial intelligence, not the prior artificial intelligence that people used to talk about in the 1980s or 1990s. Those are very different systems. 
um, you know, expert systems and other types of systems back then. The neural network systems are the only type of expert systems that we um, are doing research on today that are showing more and more progress and that are able, excuse me, that are able to show um, a lot of uh, capabilities that are mimicking human behaviors. And, and the reason is because neural networks are basically modeling in a simpler way, in a much simplified way. Um, they're modeling what animal brains are doing. Um, so in that context, the model of a, of a neural network, meaning a network of multiple neurons, millions of neurons, and let's say one neurotransmitter, okay, because a neural network basically has the equivalent of one neurotransmitter, whereas a human brain has close to 30 neurotransmitters, it's much more sophisticated. But a neural network, artificial neural network today, using only a single neurotransmitter and using very simple neurons, and um, but but these neurons are, are perfect neurons, whereas in human brain and animal brains, the neurons are not perfect. They have a lot of fluctuation and, and change. So in that sense, these artificial systems are a little better, but in other areas, they're, they're worse. But nonetheless, the capability that we're seeing out of these artificial systems is starting to match a lot of behavior from humans that we used to consider very sophisticated behaviors. And some of you may have heard of, of a system called GP, uh, Cat Chat GPT, which um, was released in December of uh, 2022, just, just last month, December 5th. Um, and that system is, I'm going to talk about that system, although there are many other systems and there are many other systems that have shown many other areas of human behavior that are just as sophisticated. For example, there are systems out there that have integrated robotics, meaning movement, movement of, of an organism, of an animal, you might say, of a robot, you might say, um, and its ability to manipulate limbs and its ability to, to grasp objects in the physical world and to be dexterous and to be able to be nimble and to be able to, to you know, move in, in ways and dance all, pretty much the way humans do um, or animals do. All of these characteristics have been shown in other systems. Chat GPT doesn't have that ability, but I'm only going to talk about Chat GPT. But there are other systems that have uh, comparable uh, human behaviors, other than simply cognitive behaviors. But tonight, I'm only going to talk about the, the cognitive abilities of Chat GPT because that's something that I think helps us to, to look into, into a lot of what we're talking about. So here are three um, quotes from just general um, uh, uh, magazines and, and, and periodicals. Um, Vanity Fair had an article recently. It, 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 Talked, it mentioned a chat GPT made me question what it means meant to be a creative human. Um, another uh, uh, newspaper, Guardian, talked about chat GPT, an eerily good human impersonator. Eerily good impersonator of humans. Um, Fortune magazine talked about, um, described chat GPT, it may be the most human form of AI yet. And the reason is because it produces informed BS, uh, meaning it, it makes mistakes in a believable way, as humans do. And I'm going to uh, explain on that, because a lot of the people who are looking at ChatGPT are comparing it to human adults. But to really understand these systems, you have to understand them and compare them to children, not to adults. So if you think of what a human child does, ChatGPT behaves like a human child. The types of mistakes it makes or like human child. I'm not saying that the processes are the same, but what's happening in the chat GPT system, I'm not saying it's the same as what's happening in a human child's brain. Not at all. They're very different. But the types of um, training that's happened and the, uh, the types of information that's being processed and the way that the information is being processed, those aspects are similar because the, the model of an artificial neural network mimics very closely the way information is handled in biological neuronal systems. The way information is handled in these two systems are very similar. Um, although, again, as I mentioned, an artificial neural network handles much less information. It only has a single neurotransmitter. So the amount of information it can handle is much less than, than uh, biological brains. But the way that it handles that information is similar. And so, so the analogy here is that chat GPT, it's more accurate to compare it to a, a infant. To, not to an infant, to, to a young child. Now, a talk that I did last year, I described the same concept and I explained back then that artificial neural systems, back then, this was about a year and a half ago, I described. And I said that 
artificial neural systems at that time were comparable to a six-month-old, at best, a six-month-old infant, human, human infant, at best, a six-month-old infant. Now, the chat GPT has evolved in a year and a half, and it's closer to, you might say, a two- or three-year-old infant, or actually, I, sorry, it, it actually is closer to a four- to five-year-old infant because it has language. It has many of the characteristics that four- to five-year-old children have. Um, I'm, I'm talking about spoken language or sorry, written language because it's a it's a written it's a writing based tool. Um, it doesn't have arms and legs, so you can't compare it to you know a, a human child that can wear clothes, for example. So only speaking about its ability to to read and write uh, language, and not just English language, many types of human languages, pretty much any type of human language, um, any type of popular human language. Um, it can handle. Um, it, it, it easily understands um, a paragraph that has Chinese, as well as French, as well as English, as well as Esperanto. Um, all of these languages mixed in together in the same paragraph, it will interpret and understand and translate into a fifth language if you ask it to do that. That's the sophistication, which, again, that's beyond what a four or five year old can do. But in terms of the the translation ability is higher than a four or five year old. But in terms of the emotional ability and understanding of the physical world and the world it exists in, that that's what I mean by it's uh, um, it's it's at a, it's equivalent to a four or five year old. Because if you ask it certain questions, its understanding of the world is mimics the way that a four year old or five year old understands the world. Um, sometimes they will guess at things and get it wrong. Etc. So anyway, so I have some examples uh, from here that, that I'm going to give. And these are all around chat GPT. I just want to talk about this one system tonight because it's easier to talk about one system. Um, so this is so the way the chat GPT works is, is you give it, you, you tell it something or you say something to it. And it says something back to you. And usually what most people do is they ask it questions. <clears throat> you don't have to. You can make a statement. And it might agree or disagree, or it might do something around your statement. It doesn't have to be a question. But many of the people who interact with ChatGPT usually give a question. A lot of the examples that I've given here are these types of question prompts. So at the top of this is the prompt that was given to ChatGPT. Write a two stanza poem about Warren Buffett. And the, and the bottom section is the answer that it gave, the, the response that it gave. And it, it said stanza one, Warren Buffett, the man of the hour, the master of finance with incredible power, his savvy investments have made him a king, his wisdom is sought by investors seeking, etc. So I'm not going to read the whole thing. So what you can see is this is obviously it's not highly creative, but it's equivalent to, um, and, and the, probably this is a little better poetry than what a four or five year old would write. Um, it's probably closer to a, to a junior high or even a high school student. Um, it's rhyming, but and the idea around Warren Buffett is probably at a higher level than what a four or five year old would have. So again, ChatGPT in certain elements shows higher level behaviors to, to higher humans. Other, but, but if you want to compare it overall, if you want to say the best capability that it has, the best capabilities that it has are of a four year old that has learned some things that adult humans can do. Um, for example, the emotional aspects of, of ChatGPT are not uh, as adults. Um, so anyway, so this is one example. Uh, another example is this is, uh, so this is a little more advanced. Um, write a short science fiction story about a human colony on TRAPPIST-1E. That's, that's a, a, a planet that we found around a, a, a distant star, around TRAPPIST-1E that encounters alien life. So write a short science fiction about a human colony that encounters alien life on an alien planet in the style of Dr. Seuss. So this is pretty unique, okay? The story has to be written as a Dr. Seuss story that's written for children. And this is what ChatGPT generated on the bottom. So once there was a human colony on TRAPPIST-20, a small distant planet that was quite hard to see, they built their homes and farms and schools and lived their lives in happiness and joy without any rules. Now, you can see sense of Dr. Seuss. It's not exactly because Dr. Seuss doesn't have very long sentences. Um, so that's a little bit of a, of a difference. But if you read this, uh, you know, but, but one day as they were going about their day, they had a strange, unearthly sound. They heard a strange, unearthly sound. It was a noise that, that had never heard before. It made them all stop and stare around. You see a lot of elements of Dr. Seuss, right? You see that that um, the language, uh, the rhyming, um, the fact that it's uh, um, the, the types of words are, are simple words, although um, uh, you know some of the ideas, you know, distant planet. I mean, that's not you know some children. Uh, 
young children may not know that, but but in general, it's trying to follow the uh, the structure of, of the doctor. Says, this is the next. It continues. They followed the sound to a clearing in the woods, and there they saw a sight that really shut them up. A group of alien creatures, tall and green, with tentacles and eyes and wings that had never been seen, etc. So anyway, so this, this is to some extent in the style of Dr. Seuss. It is a story about a human colony that's on an alien planet and seeing alien creatures. So this is showing elements of, you might say, moderate sophistication, um, probably a little higher than, than, a, than a four or five year old. Here's a prompt which is more around uh, a real world. Okay. Who was older when elected, Grover Cleveland or George Bush? And the answer is, um, and this is a paragraph, Grover Cleveland was older when he was elected president than George H.W. Bush. Now, what this chat GPT did is interpret it because it probably figured out that there are two George Bushes. It was George Bush Sr. and George Bush Jr. And it decided on its own, for whatever reason, it decided George Bush Sr. Okay? And the answer is consistent in that it's talking about George Bush Sr. It's not mixing up George Bush Jr. and George Bush Sr. Because if this was simply going on the internet and finding information, it might find one article about George Bush Sr., another article about George Bush Jr., and it might mix the two and give you a convoluted answer. But that's not what it's doing. Another element that I need to explain here is that chat GPT cannot go on the internet. Most of these, these systems are known as large language models. Okay? Meaning what the way that they're developed is that during the, the point at which they're being developed and trained, they're fed information. They don't have access to the internet. They don't have access to anything. They're given large chunks of data, you might say in a database, and then they read all of that information. They absorb all of that information. And then they it processes and it kind of marinates in their brain, similar to how if you teach a child, if you read a story to a child over and over and over and over, if you repeat the same story to a child over and over and over, that child learns, it pretty much memorizes the story, it can repeat parts of the story to you when you're reading it to it. And that's, that's actually what starts to happen in, in these large language models also, is they, they start to recognize the same, if you give it the same language and ask it to repeat it, if it's, if it's seen that story you know, a thousand times, then, then a thousand and one, one time, if you ask, if you give it 10 sentences, ask for the 11th sentence, it will fairly accurately be able to repeat that 11th sentence, similar to what a human child can do, because the learning is in a similar way. So the reason why, why I talked about the internet learning is that these systems, they're given lots of information, and once the training is done, they have no new information. They cannot go on the internet to learn new things. So this system was given all the information that, well, not all, but we had a vast amount of information about all of the presidents and many other things. So it knew about George H.W. Bush as well as George W. Bush's son. It knew about both of these people. It knew that both these people were presidents. And it knew that both these people, um, uh, you know, had an age, you know, characteristics of what it means to be a human being, all of the, you know, being a, the presidents are elected, etc. So the prompt doesn't talk about president. It doesn't have the word president in it. It simply has the word elected. And most humans, most advanced humans, will figure out that the word elected has to do with politics or government or something like that. Because we know elected is a, is, is a tie to politics and elections. So, and, and in the US, elections have to do with presidents or other um, positions. And we know that the two names given here, Grover Cleveland and George Bush, each of those we, most people would recognize they were American presidents. So we tie these ideas together to understand and interpret what the question means and what the question is asking. And this is similar to what Chat, Chat GPT did. It did similar things, except not only did it do that, the explanation gave actually helps us to understand that this is what's been trained. It's been taught to do this is to um, extract, is to um, explify, to, to basically explain itself when it gives answers. And this, this is one of the things that you'll find. Rarely do it simply give a, a one sentence answer unless you ask it for that. Usually it'll give, it'll expound on its answer explaining how it came up to the conclusion. So here's the answer it gave. Now, the reason why I gave this example is because here, it made a logical error. It made a very simple error. Um, it said Grover Cleveland was older when he was elected president than George H. W. Bush. Um, um, he, he was born on such a date, elected such a date, and he was age 47. Then it says George H. W. Bush was um, age 64. Right? So who was older when he was born? According to this, George H. W. Bush was older. But the answer it gave was George was Grover Cleveland. So this is strange, right? It has all of the information here to understand that 
George H.W. Bush was older when elected president. He was 64. 64 is larger, is greater than 47. But what happened here was it made a mistake. Now, we can't exactly explain why it made the mistake. I mean, the, the, the researchers who created the system, they have tools where they can delve into it. Okay, and they have done things like that. But in this case, I don't have the tools. I haven't looked at that, but I can extrapolate with my understanding. Probably what was happening was that this idea has many, this prompt or this question has many elements of the concept of time embedded within it. Okay, and so, for example, one of the things around time is that the year when Grover Cleveland was president, right, in the 1800s versus George W. Bush in the 1900s. So that's one element of time. Another element of time is the um, the lifespan of each of the presidents, not simply when they became president, but how long they lived for, because it gave their birth date and, and uh, when they were elected president, actually didn't give their, their death date, but it, it knows when they died. So that's also part of what it knows. So all of these different aspects of time are things that it's considering. But the mistake it made here is that it wasn't sure which of those aspects of time it had to choose. Possibly it chose the aspect of time that Grover Cleveland was a president at an earlier time period than George H. W. Bush in the 1800s versus 1900s. That's why it may have said Grover Cleveland was older because the word older um, can correspond to earlier, okay, depending on how you look at time. So, so this problem, I'm not saying this is what happened, but this explains. And, yeah. Sanjay, can I ask you a quick question here? Because it also, from what I recall, made the mistake that 47 was greater than 64. Right. So that right. It, yeah. so that it wasn't just simply the older aspect of it. It was a right. fundamental right. calculation aspect of it. Well, well, well we, we don't we don't know if it if it said felt that 64 is greater than 67. Okay? Because see this is this is this is what, what, what this is the reason why I talked about a child's brain. Because if you think about what a child does, children do very similar things. They understand that five is greater than two. But if you ask them to compare an egg that weighs five pounds, is it heavier than an egg that weighs two pounds? They'll make a similar mistake to this. Even though they understand five is greater than two, they don't necessarily understand that a weight of five is heavier than a weight of two. They might not understand that. And that's what, I, again, I'm speculating. And it's reasonable to say that. Because this is because it does know what, that 64 is greater than 47. It does know that. And there are many, many examples where you can prompt it. Many types of numbers. Any type of, you can give fractional numbers. You can give, any, you can give equations that result in a, in a single digit answer and ask, is the result of this equation greater than the result of this equation? And it will always be correct as long as the equations are simple. Okay? If you get into very complex equations, that's when you reach the limit. But for simple equations, even if you give convoluted questions, it can figure it out because it does understand most you know, numbers. If you get into infinities or if you get into, um, if you give it equations where it has to uh, do calculus, it might not be able to do it. Or some calculus problems it may be able to solve, but others it may not be able to solve. So that's kind of at the edge of its understanding. But basic numbers, basic numerals, it has a pretty good grasp of. But in this case, I believe that the reason why it made the mistake was not about 64 versus 47. It was about the concept of older. And older encapsulates time. But there are several versions of time in this paragraph, in this thought, that it had to deal with. It had to figure out many different areas of older. And it got confused or picked the wrong one. Just as earlier I said that it had to decide between George W. Bush or George H. W. Bush. It had to arbitrarily decide. And it did arbitrarily decide. And there's no right or wrong there. Similarly, um, it may have okay. arbitrarily decided to pick one of those versions of time and not realize that it shouldn't have, that one of those versions of time is correct and the other ones are incorrect. Um, can I let Madeline in for a quick question? Is that yeah. okay? Okay, yes, um, <clears throat> this is very interesting. Thank you, Sanjay. Yeah. Uh, this puts me in mind of um, McDonald's and their quarter pounder. They had introduced a one-third pounder, but it never took off because no one wanted it because it was going to be smaller than the quarter pounder. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes. So, so th this is this is. Um, so I don't know if you're sorry. You, is that? Were you going to? Um, 
No, no. Um, I mean, it, it's relevant, but I, I leave it to no, you. No, it is relevant. So I, I, I wasn't sure if you were finished with the, with the, um, the example. Because I, 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 I think it's a very good example because so this is this is the same issue that we see in, in human beings um, in that. And, and again, the issue, the two issues, one issue is around our ability to um, understand numbers but also in our relative abilities to understand numbers, meaning a child's ability to understand numbers versus an adult's ability to understand numbers. Even though most adults go to McDonald's and they buy food there, many adults still don't understand the difference between a quarter and a, and a third. They understand the difference between two and three, and they misunderstand that two, because two is less than three, they miss out, or, or sorry, uh, that three is less than four, they misunderstand that a third is less than a quarter that one over four and one over three are not the same as three and four. So a lot of adult humans misunderstand that. And the reason is because their understanding of numbers is actually at a child's level. That's the reason. So in this case, what ChatGPT did is it has a child's understanding, not of numbers, but of the interaction between numbers, of how do you compare different types of numbers. So yeah, that, that's a perfect example of, of um, human beings doing the exact, you know, similar, you know, I could see, you know, a human being, if they had to do this type of analysis in their brain, they couldn't write it down that they had to remember exactly the year the Grover Cleveland was born in and the year he, he became president and do a subtraction of their mind and then do the same thing with George H.W. Bush and do a subtraction of their mind. If you go through all of these steps, about 15 or 20 different things, by the end of it, they might forget something critical and make a simple mistake and give, a, give an incorrect answer. And that's a lot of times what people do. And so that's very similar to what ChatGPT does today. It does for, for some things that are a little more complicated than, than basic, it, it sometimes makes mistakes. And it's for more com complicated things, it actually makes mistakes more often. So um, that's the level that we're seeing. It's not that ChatGPT is not sophisticated. In some areas, it's highly sophisticated, equal to, or in some cases, you know, well, I don't want to say better, but equal to m many humans. Um, but in other areas, it's it's comparable to a child, human child. Um, just to just to um, continue this, a human being wouldn't make the mistake that that the AI made in the presidential example. We would know immediately what older meant. An right. AI yes. would never make the quarter pounder mistake. Well, it depends on the AI. It depends on the AI. I mean, earlier uh -huh. versions, earlier versions of language, large language models did make that type of mistake. They did. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was assuming they were they were as good as math as a calculator, but maybe not. No, no, no. So, so that's one thing. That's a very important. That's an excellent point. That that's an important point. Let me let me let me expound on that. The large language model does not do any calculation. It doesn't do calculations. It doesn't do. Um, um, or let me explain it. It is not like a traditional computer. What, what the normal computers that we're used to today are basically calculating everything. Okay? Artificial intelligence systems don't do calculations in that way. Any calculation that they do is similar to the way that human beings do calculations, which are approximating. Humans do calculations by approximation. And a lot of the calculations that we do, we do because we've learned to do relative proportional things with numbers. We manipulate numbers in, in, in uh, analog ways, um, not in exact discrete ways. So, um, so so the example I gave earlier with the human child comparing a five pound egg to a three pound, to, to, excuse me, two pound egg, um, which is heavier, similar to the quarter pounder example. A human child would make that example because a human child has probably not experienced a five pound egg in a, in a two pound egg. So to them, the difference, or, or you know, if we make it even more uh, elaborate, if you say that the that the radius of an egg, the radius of one egg is five centimeters, and the radius of another egg is two centimeters, the human child definitely would not understand what radius is. They would understand that radius is a characteristic of an egg. They would understand that, but they don't know if radius, um, what, how to assess the characteristic of a radius of an egg. And so, if you ask them to compare the radii of two different eggs, they might make a mistake, and that's similar to what. What, what you know humans do with quarter pounders or what chat do. Right? So again, I'm not saying that this is exactly what happened. I'm saying this is an explanation because understanding that chat GPT's understanding of certain aspects of things are not fully 
uh, adult human-like. Um, that's what we have to recognize. And, and so it may be that the mistake it made is a different area, but definitely the mistake is in comparing numbers. And the fact that this uh, paragraph has a lot of numbers in it, but more importantly, it has a lot of time uh, periods in it. And it's really being asked to compare uh, time, you know, age. Age is, is, is directly an aspect of time, of human time. So that's the reason why I felt that that was probably what it, it aired on. Um, but again, that's that's speculation. I can't be sure of that. Uh, thank you. So, um, so we have a couple. Uh, we, of we can take some. Yeah, we can take some questions, but I don't want to take too many questions. We can, unless they're specific to what we're talking about right now. If not, I, I'd appreciate if you can hold and we'll we'll have another question answer at the end. We'll, we'll have closing comments and Q and A at the end also. Yeah. So, um, uh, Ella or Mike, is this uh, specific to this particular slide? Uh, yes. that we're talking yeah, about just, right I now. just have a sentence or two that's specific to this slide. Okay, Ella, uh, then let's, if Sanjay, if you're okay with it. Yeah, let's yeah. Just ask them. Yeah. Sure. Um, sure. Thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, it seems to be that the critical reading with all of the time elements is, is just, is the problem. And, and I think many... Um, a number of students would be caught up in this as well, because it's just so much, and it requires real concentration for the human child uh, with all the numbers involved. So I think you're right about the time and the number of different time errors that or that could occur potentially. And um, <clears throat> so, but my point, my question is: look at the question itself which was written by a programmer, I'm assuming, who was older when elected, Grover Cleveland or George Bush? Grover Cleveland or George Bush is a fragment. So is it possible that the programmer threw off the, the bot, the computer, by not formulating a proper sentence with a subject? Okay, so let me. It's um, so, confusing to a child. So, so the quick answer is no, um, and, and let me explain. So, so first of all, the the prompt was not set by a programmer. The um, so ChatGPT right. is 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 available. Um, not everybody, but most people can can get access to it. You have to pay for it. It's it's not free, but it's not very expensive either. It costs about pennies pennies to use, but you have to know the account. You have to go through a process and. Um, you know, not, not just anybody can use it. You have to have a certain type of computers, etc. So this was entered by, um, by not, not by a programmer, not by anybody, not, not the development team. Um, you can go on there if you get access and you can type this exact same prompt. Um, and chances are you will not get the exact same answer. Chances are that the answer will be slightly different. That's another thing that's important to note is that ChatGPT is not just regurgitating. And also similar to what happens in humans, its thinking process is not identical every single time. This is something that, that we've seen also similar to, I mean, I did a talk earlier about uh, Wall-E. Wall-E and Wall-E2 are, are um, artificial intelligence systems which create art. And if you ask, if you give it the exact same prompt, um, you know, draw, draw um, a, a, a picture in the style of Rembrandt um, of a party on, on the riverbanks of the Seine. If you give that prompt and you give that prompt 50 times, you'll get 50 different pictures that are each of them are, some of them can be vastly different. Some of them will be similar to each other, but none of them will be identical. And that's what's unique is that these systems are not repeating or they're not doing calculations. This is nothing like calculations. It is not like a traditional system, not like, not like a traditional computer. Another thing um, about your question, that's uh, two other things that you mentioned that are important. The fragment, that did not, that would not have uh, confused us because what large language models do is that they learn human communication, human written communication. So because humans communicate in these ways, they learn and they become familiar with it. So chat GPT is completely comfortable with fragmented sentences, vague sentences, things like that. Although, just for example, in this case, George Bush is a vague part of that question because there are two, and, and chat GPT would have known there are two different George Bushes who were president. And probably the person who wrote this did it intentionally to, to see what would happen. Um, and, and the fact that so the fact that it's a fragment sentence was not a problem. I don't believe that would have affected this at all. 
And the last part of the question is that um, um, the aspect of time, again, you, you iterated on another aspect of it, which, which I agree with, but when you said that, it reminded me of another thing that's very important to say, and that's that um, I, I was starting to say it in a previous example, but I didn't go further. You know, um, there's so much that, that I have a, that I can explain about. I don't want to stay on one slide, but so anyway. So the idea that's important that that I was that I thought earlier was that Chat GPT does not have any memory, or, have, or if you want to think of it, it has a very very short memory span, and that's fundamental by design. Um, and because uh, memory is very difficult, uh, or human-like memory, where memory spans um, minutes or hours, is quite difficult to do, and, and they are working on it, and probably newer systems will have that, but it also takes a lot more computing power to do that. That's one of the reasons why these systems today don't have a vast amount of human memory. Memory meaning, if you ask it a question, and then you ask it a different question later on, it might not recognize that the two questions are related it's, in some cases it might, but in other cases it might not. So that's, and, and that also happens with human children. So the fact that memory is limited means that in the analysis it was doing of the multiple types of time, it couldn't keep track of all of the different types of time. And therefore it may have, some of those information about time may have just fallen by the wayside in its quote unquote brain. And that may have been why. It, it's not that it necessarily chose, it may have been that a brain can't hold four different versions of time at the same time. It can only hold two. And so the remaining two that were left, out of the remaining two, both of those were wrong, but one was more correct, and that's what it chose. That may have been what happened. So that's um, a great Mike. question. Uh, Mike. Okay, my comment is kind of similar to what you've been saying. Uh, the uh, uh, Now that you see that the programmers have seen this, uh, there's probably something the tweak that can make to either the scoring of the answer or the training set to fix this problem. And uh, it's also tied to the so-called Chinese uh, room paradox. Uh, it can, uh, the, the computer doesn't, uh, can parse the syntax, but it doesn't know what age is. It doesn't know what time is. It doesn't, it's uh, doing syntax and it's coming up with something that makes that uh, fit and uh, associated uh, the older in the beginning with the age and the and the other part of the sentence uh, probably needs some uh, additional training sets to make that and policy and scoring to uh, phenomena to make that work. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mike. Um, I wanted to just add uh, one thing on that. So you used. Um, so the, the the Chinese room problem that that is I'm not going to go into that but but I don't think that limitation or let me say it another way the limit of the Chinese room problem is starting to be overcome I'm not sure if you I think you might understand what I'm saying by that I'm not going to go into elaborate on that but but I will say why because the second thing that you said that this is using syntax, that is not true. Um, these large language model systems, they are not, they don't understand in the way that we think of understanding language and syntax, they don't understand language and syntax in that way. So when it was thinking about um, giving an answer to the question, okay, just as a four-year-old doesn't understand syntax, but they've heard English, they've heard properly used English sufficient number of times that they automatically, the brain automatically picks the right words in the right order, in the right grammatical syntax, and they speak it. That's what it's doing. It's not analyzing and picking syntax. It's not doing any of that. It's similar to what we do as a child when we speak. We haven't learned syntax or grammar at that age. Um, just as a two-year-old starts to develop very rudimentary sentences, uh, the earlier language models had the same characteristics. They didn't understand syntax, but they were able to to communicate in, in a similar way. So um, anyway, so so these systems are not calculating. If it if it had an understanding of syntax, it would be have to do calculation. Now, a more advanced version of what you said is that if you ask it a question about syntax, it will be able to answer it, but not because it's calculating syntax. What it actually has 
is it's read enough papers. It's read enough. You can think of them as research papers or even high school papers or any kind of paper for that matter, articles, anything about what it means to have syntax in language one, English, language two, German, and language three, um, uh, Taiwanese. You know, in each of these languages, um, there is there are unique rules of syntax and grammar, and it's learned those rules um, in the similar way that a high school student would learn them, not in the way that a four-year-old would learn them. So if you ask it a question about language syntax, it's going to have to use the mental processes, the higher order mental processes that a high school student would use to give you an analysis of grammar. Not, but, and, and, and a four-year-old would not be able to do that. So there are distinct aspects of these systems that mimic what a young human brain does and other aspects that mimic what a sophisticated older human brain does. That's important to understand. So in this, it's doing, it, it was doing both. It was doing a little bit of number of calculations and, and you know, understanding about years and time and age and things like that, which again, doesn't require high school understanding, but it does require around a five, eight, nine-year-old understanding. Uh, Four-year-olds don't always understand um, what elected means. So, you know, this is a little higher than a four or five year old. But anyway, um, let, let's get back to the, if there's nothing else, Mike or anyone else, let's the, get back to the, to the, the talk. We're close to there the are, There oh. are two other people that want to comment, but uh, if it's a slide, I guess, um, do you want to go ahead and let them? Yeah, are they, are they, are Ian, your questions Ian, on the slide? Ian uh, and Madeline, is it about uh, this? Uh, I'll wait, it's fine. I, it's, not, okay. it's not urgent. Uh, it, it's nothing really. Same. Okay. I'll wait too. Okay. okay. You, you can you can bring it up, and if it's brief, we can we can do it. If it's related to the ideas we've well, talked about, we can we'll, we'll wait till the end, and we'll go okay. we'll, because it's getting late. So I, I want to yeah. keep moving here. Yeah, I'm going to wrap up in about uh, at most 20 minutes. I don't think it, or probably less than that, depending on. So here's another example. So this example is, is a little bit of mathematics. Um, prompt at the top is a simple word problem that you know many uh, great, uh, grade schoolers or, or junior high students would have. At the bottom, it actually shows excuse me, it goes through the internal logic. And again, it's not the logic that it's doing. It's, it's, this is a more higher form of logic that a older child would use or that an older human would use. Uh, you know, a, maybe a fifth grader or a sixth grader would use or even an eighth grader. So, um, you know, it, it goes through and it explains exactly what it did and gives an answer. Um, and in this case, it was correct. So, um, you know, we don't have to go through the actual example. The point here is that um, the different types of behaviors, human-like behaviors, that, that this is one system, ChatGPT. All these are from the same system. So all these different types of behaviors that it can do. So here's here's a different one. This is a little more creative. So in the middle, in the center, is a prompt that, that an ordinary person gave. Again, these are not programmers, or these are not people who did were on the development team. These are random people in society today, like you and me. One of us can go and, and, and give this exact prompt. So this prompt is, Write a script for a sitcom about a bold man who's really into the sister of his best female friend. This is a prompt. And it gave basically a script, a TV script. It generated a TV script. Okay, so if you read it, cut two. So cut two is instruction for a camera, for the camera crew. Interior living room later. So these are this is the style that actual scripts are written in, which are usable and functional. So it's written in that style. Jessica and her sister Sarah enter the living room. Jim greets him, and Jim says something, which is covered up. Jessica says something. So, what have you been up to, Jim? Jim responds, and then in parentheses, trying to impress Sarah. So these are prompts and cues for the actor and actors. So this is very similar to what an actual human, uh, what person would write in a script. This is another page of it. Jim excited. Sure, that would be great. I'll see you soon. Again, this sounds like an average. You know, I don't think this is a a very sophisticated or, or, or you know necessarily very funny sitcom. It might be an ordinary type of sitcom because, again, ChatGPT is not highly tuned to write amazing sitcoms. It isn't trained to write any sitcom. All it did is it was trained in all kinds of human writing. So it was probably given, you know, 2,000 scripts that people have written. And using those 2,000 scripts, it learned about the concept of a script and what goes into a script. So it basically pulled out the meaning and the, and the structure and the phenomenology and, and the information that has to be in a script. 
um, and what it means for a script to be sitcom versus you know another type. So all of these things are gleaned automatically. Nobody told it. Nobody trained it on any of that. All that the person did, that the programmers did, they're not programmers, all that the development team did, where they collected, let's say, 2,000 um, scripts for television uh, shows, and they entered them. They put them into a database, and they entered them <laughs> into the system. And the system basically read them one by one by one and absorbed it into its brain, into its understanding. That's all. There was no programming involved. So this is... So that's why this is not going to be a very high sophisticated type of script, but at least at this point, it's giving a script which appears to be similar to most other scripts that an average human being would be able to write. Now, this can be developed more if you give it 50,000 scripts, very high quality, then chat GPT would be an award-winning script writer. It can be made into an award-winning script writer by giving it examples of award-winning scripts. This is what this technology is about. And the same thing happens in a human being. If a human being goes to a, a phenomenal art school and they're exposed to really great techniques and styles and, and they learn how what makes award-winning scripts, they've absorbed and learned what makes an award-winning script. Not in the same way as, as ChatGPT learned. It learns by reading. A human being learns in other ways, but the end product is the same, that you end up with a human being who can create award-winning scripts, or you end up with a, a large learning language model which can create award-winning scripts. So again, not that this script is, here's, here's one, I'm not gonna go into detail, this is uh, on, on uh, um, investments. So hi, I'm, the prompt is very small, sorry about that. So hi, I'm new to investing and want to get educated, where do I start? So basically it's asking about investing, how do I start investing? And I gave a two-page answer, I'm not gonna go into it. Now, this is an example where it may actually have simply, because um, that type of prompt, is something that you can find on Wikipedia. So it, well, all it may have done is gone through its memory and, and found information. Now, it, it, it doesn't know that this information is in a Wikipedia article. All it knows is that it knows, it's absorbed the knowledge from Wikipedia. It doesn't know it came from Wikipedia. It simply knows it has this knowledge. It's like a person who's lived in the world and has, has done investing on their own, absorbs this knowledge. They can't point out that I learned this information from this person on this date. Most of us can't, can't explain that. Similarly, ChatGPT can't explain that it learned this information from Wikipedia. It can't explain that. It simply knows its information. And we know, because we provided Wikipedia to it, we know that chances are that that Wikipedia information, or maybe information from any articles on investing, all that put together is what helped it understand about investing. So that, that basically was. Here's another prompt. Write me a Rust code. Rust is a programming language. Write me a program in Rust code to get Bitcoin to USD prices from Coinbase. Coinbase is another website. And it came up with an actual program. Now, something to understand about ChatGPT, and this is true of also other language models, is that not only do they understand human languages, they will understand any type of. So, if you give it runic language, which is which is a, a, a fake language that is in the Lord of the Rings and other you know, fictional uh, stories, any language that's in written form, if you give it, it will learn it. So, and, and not only will it learn it, it will learn it correctly. For example, that's the reason why its grammar tends to be impeccable or more on the correct side. So the programming that it does also tends to be correct. Most of the time when you give it a prompt like this to give it a, to output a program, the program will run correctly and do exactly what you asked it to do. So it, it, it basically can do, for simple programs, it can do programming out of the box. So that's another aspect, which, which again is, is getting into creativity. So let, let me end here. Um, I, I have a, a, some demos that I'm gonna do. These are, these are simple examples. Let me um, stop. Sharing here, I'm gonna to go to a different, um, I need to um, maybe, uh, so let me just go back to the um, share screen. I have some demos that I'm gonna show you. And uh, so hopefully everybody can see this. Okay. It, it, you should see a cat on your screen. Is, yeah. that, is that right? Okay, right, so, so sure. this basically is a website that um, what it does, now this website is using older technology. Okay, this technology is about um, five to seven years old. Okay, but it's still neural network based. And the reason why I'm saying that is because this is much older, much more primitive technology. Now this website is designed to basically create pictures of cats, which means that every single picture of a cat that you're going to see is not a real picture. It's not a real cat. 
okay? It conceptualized and in a sense drew or created a photograph, an artificial photograph of a cat. But every one of these photographs will look real. Now this one, there's some funny things you'll see on the bottom right corner, there's this kind of artifact. So this one isn't as good. You know, the head appears to be very, and the body doesn't seem to match exactly. So it's not good again. And again, that's because this, this language, this is this um, version of, of uh, the neural network is, is less sophisticated. Than if the same one was created using today's technology, you would not see those artifacts. But again, most of the pictures are very, very real. This picture is very real. The background is blurry. The whiskers are very distinct. Um, you know, you don't see whiskers coming out of its eyes. Or, you know, the ears are not symmetrical. You know, they're in, in real, in a lot of the characteristics of real cats, this, this has. Um, many, 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 you know, this one, there, there's some spurious, although this can be underneath the cat, we don't know at the bottom right, we're not sure, but, um, you know, so most of these pictures will look real to, to some it, extent. Is this right? the program that they were running out at Google? Uh, um, I don't remember if Google, I don't think Google, no, this is, this was a, um, a team that, um, no, this is, this is a, a small private company that created this. It's, it's basically, this is, a, this is a GAN. Um, uh, it's it's a it's a old, much older technology. Let me um, let me try to uh, hold on. Let, let me go to another one of these sites and give another version of this. So th this this is a version where what it does is it creates human faces. Okay. So the other one did cats. This one does human faces. Again, each of these are not real people. Okay. These are not real pictures of real people, um, and the scenes are completely. You know, design. And again, you'll see the chin here is is a this is because the technology here is very old. But most of the picture is very realistic. It looks like a photograph. And most of the pictures, around 80% of the pictures, uh, somebody would not be able to tell that this is an artificial picture. That this is not a real photograph of a real person. Um, most of these pictures are, are phenomenal in the realism, and that's something to to, to recognize. Um, all right. Um, out of these six or seven pictures we've seen so far, only one of these had some strange things in them. Most of these pictures are, are completely realistic. Um, here's another one. I think this one might be. Uh, oh, this one is about artwork. Okay, so this this is uh, it, it creates random pieces of art and any type of art. Um, and so again, th this is the creative part of, of AI. And th these are again older than ChatGPT. These are at least um, you know you might say. Uh, 20 years older in human terms. You know, the, earlier I, I compared the, the difference between ChatGPT and prior language learning models. That the prior models were close to a, five, a half year old, six month old child, and the ones today are closer to a four or five year old. But in one and a half years of human time, the language model has has grown uh, 10 times in complexity. 10 years, at, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, 10 times in complexity. Basically, four years in complexity. So in one and a half years of real human time. It's grown four years in its capability. So that's that's what I'm trying to explain. So these are about 10 years or 15 years backwards in human complexity, these models, but they're still doing a pretty good job. This, this art, these art models are not going to be as good uh, because art is so subjective and there's so many elements to art. Um, and then the last one we'll do is, is just, uh, what it, I think it does, actually there's more. There's one that it actually does chemical, uh, um, uh, chemical atom, uh, chemical molecules. It actually draws and come up, comes up with chemical molecules. But the only thing is, those chemical molecules obey many of the laws of chemistry and physics. So they are, they could be possibly real chemical molecules that may be synthesized. Um, but that that one I'm not going to run because that uh, is a little slower and it uh, may not run as well. So these again are horses, and these these are more sophisticated pictures, not just of the horses, but of jockeys and other things in between in the pictures. So again, this is where this is a scene of a horse, not just a horse alone with people and a fence, large fence. You know, so all of these are very realistic. Um, although some of these pictures have some anomalies also. Um, so again, th this is uh, just um, multiple horses here. So let me end here. Um, so uh, just to to and on a lot of these systems have develop, been developed by human beings. That's the one thing that, that is a constant right now is that these systems are not able to learn on their own. They have to be taught by human beings by, by giving them knowledge. And, and that's comparable to what a child, a young child has to do. A young child cannot find a book by itself and read the book by itself. It has to be read too. And that's comparable to what these systems are like. But in the future, as just as after a child learns to 
go to a library by itself and get a book and then read the book. These systems will be able to do that eventually. They, they, they will be trained to interface to the internet and actually go on the internet and do find what it wants to do and learn and advance its own knowledge, which humans are at. None of these systems can advance its own knowledge today. And they're intentionally limited in that because there are um, safety reasons for not allowing it onto the internet right now. Um, but as we, as uh, you know, a lot of the companies that are working on these learn to build in these safety factors within the system itself, similar to how we teach a child to not curse, right? We teach a child from an early age not to speak in certain ways, um, not to shout, not to behave in certain ways. So these systems have to be taught similar rules of, of the road or rules of, of our culture of, hum of humanity. And that's also part of what we're trying to do right now. We're trying to teach it how to be sensitive to people, how to be, um, you know, uh, balanced and not not biased, uh, because a lot of the internet has biases that you know from past, uh, you know, things like this that you may have heard about. The internet is full of biases. A lot of these early systems actually repeated the biases that are existing in human society. And so now, one of the things that we're doing is we're teaching these systems to look for and kind of compensate for or to remove the biases that already exists in humans and in the internet. So we're making them more advanced and more like better human beings in a sense. Um, so let me end there. Um, so if anybody has any uh, uh, comments yeah, or, or so questions. If anybody, can... anybody has any questions, go ahead and type exclamation point in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom. Uh, and we can go from there. Uh, I think Madeline so, yeah. and Ian may have. Um, yeah, if you Ian, to go back to your you, questions, that's fine. Yeah, Ian, did you have a question? Well, original question actually been overshadowed by uh, Sanjay's subsequent exposition, but but nonetheless, uh, previously, as regards to the time errors, Sanjay had uh, you had uh, speculated that the time errors were due to possibly uh, the system only be able to to operate on a certain number. Of instances of time, so to speak, uh, that was limited in terms of the number of objects that could operate or instances of the given class could operate on to invoke uh, uh, coding terminology. I recall Nick Bostrom in his super intelligence book from a few years back speculated, uh, stated that most humans can hold out seven or eight objects in their mind at one time, though of course a few genius ones can do quite a bit more, but hold quite a few more. But Bostrom has extrapolated from this to speculate that that uh, one path to head in terms of AI was to increase the number of objects or instances uh, that could be held and operated upon uh, uh, simultaneously. So uh, could we apply this strategy to the sisters of, of chat? Uh, and if so, uh, what difference that what uh, difference it might make in terms of increasing power of uh, its uh, reasoning or pattern recognition abilities? Okay, so um, if we look at how biological brains work and some of the elements that affect how biological brains work, um, we are able to add those same enhancements into neural networks. And that's what some of the um, uh, researchers and, and computer scientists are doing with neural networks. They're actually adding similar concepts into them. Now, so far, the, there are basically two things that they're doing, um, three things actually, that they're doing to improve these artificial neural networks. One is that they're expanding the number of neurons, the, the comparable version of neurons. The, the size of the brain, physical size of the brain, they're increasing. That's one. Um, two, the amount of training that they're giving to these systems, they're increasing, meaning the type of, so for example, if you, um, if you train a child um, for five years in how to dance, that child will become good at dancing. If you train that same child for 14 years to dance, that child will be, become much better at dancing, right? That's obvious. Um, now, that's what they're doing, except what they're doing also not only is getting the information, but they're, they're figuring out more efficient ways of training the system in a short amount of time. So they're figuring out ways of giving 14 years of dancing knowledge 
in let's say five years of actual time. Okay, so they're making the training process much more efficient, and much more robust, and much more um, accurate. Um, and then the third thing that they're doing is this gets into the structure and the topology. This is kind of the structure of how the quote unquote brain is formed. Um, and there, you know, the, the, again, I talked about the, the, the horse and the cat demo. That was a very early, you know, about five years ago, five to seven years ago. It was a very early uh, type of um, neural network structure, which was geared around um, uh, image formation. And it, it's not as, as advanced now. Today, there are systems called transform models, which are actually, transform models are one of the most advanced types that we have today, and they can handle multiple types of information. Um, but anyway, so um, that's the third type of changes that they're making now, is that this, the design of the network itself, which corresponds to the structure, that the way that different types of neurons in a human brain or an animal brain exist, how they're interconnected, um, the size of each of the clusters and regions, which regions interconnect with other regions and which regions do not interconnect with other regions, whether these connections are inhibitory or excitatory, all, all of these things that go into the network structure, that's where they're also expanding and making uh, more advanced and, and sophisticated. So there, and, and there are many, many other areas where they can go. For example, you know, they can easily um, look at adding in more neurotransmitters, but um, that would be much what, what we're seeing is that they can get more sophisticated, more efficient advancement without needing to do that. Basically, which, which kind of indicates that the fact that we have multiple neurotransmitters may not necessarily be a good thing. Um, it may actually be more problematic in terms of efficiency and in terms of function of, of any animal brain. And one thing we do see that kind of hints at that is that a lot of our neurotransmitters also have effect in our body. Neurotransmitters are have neurotransmitters are chemicals, biochemicals, which not only affect the brain, they also affect different parts of our body and organs. And similarly, some of our the hormones and, and enzymes in our bodies, which are designed, which are intended to only operate in our body, when they reach our brain, they actually affect our brain in let's say negative ways or unintended ways. So our body, our entire body and biology is much more convoluted because of that, because we have so many neurotransmitters and neuropeptides, and it kind of messes up. So that's one of the reasons why some hormones that humans have, um, cortisol, for example, affects our body physically as well as our brain. Um, uh, you know, um, many, many, many neurotransmitters have this effect, and some of these effects are negative on us also, whereas um, in, in an artificial system, they can get rid of all of those effects they make these systems much more efficient and much more uh, better behaving without all of the side effects that we have in humans. For example, one of the reasons why medications in humans have so many side effects is the same reason why you have so many neurotransmitters, because these side effects sometimes mimic either, they mimic other molecules in the body. Sometimes they mimic neurotransmitter behavior, sometimes they mimic um, other enzymes or other molecules in the body that naturally occur, and that mimicking of a medicine, by the medication, of the molecule in the medication, because it mimics or is similar to, that causes problems. And that's one of the reasons why our medications aren't perfect. But in a neural, in a neural network based system, if you avoid that completely, then you won't have these problems that uh, we have in biological systems. Okay. Um, are there any other questions for Sanjay? Well, I think that this was a uh, good s session. Uh, you know, I think that this was pretty, was very interesting, Sanjay. I mean, I very much appreciate it going through uh, chat GPT. It's four now. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it, it's it's interesting because you still wonder then what's the idea of intelligence like at, at a certain point, you know, if it's incapable of doing you know, if it's actually stubborn about something, that's a wrong answer. Uh, and what does it really know about the world? Or is it just actually taking in data and and essentially uh, essentially outputting, you know, essentially beautiful prose? Is it is it much different than what was claimed earlier than by the Google engineer? Uh, so that Google engineer was was totally wrong. That Google engineer yeah, was, not, was not from the design team. He didn't, under, I don't believe he understood 
how large language models work. He was on the testing side of it. Not to say that, that they don't necessarily know, but he specifically, because I, I read many interviews, I, I saw interviews also by him. He really didn't understand how large language models work. He was kind of anthropomorphizing the system. Um, right. These systems are not intelligent or aware or even self-aware at this point. They are not. That doesn't mean yeah. they can't be. Um, they might be. I'm not saying they will be. They, it's possible. We don't know yet. But um, but the, the thing that, that I think that is important to, to recognize is that these systems today are nascent children. They are. They show all of the signs of how children behave when you get when they put when you put them into a complex world. Um, and so it's unfair to compare them with adult human beings, even though some of the they, they do have some characteristics of adult human beings. But at their core, they're really children who learned how to mimic adults in some sense. But they're really still children emotionally. That's the way to think of them. Well, good. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, announce some of our upcoming meetups. Uh, tomorrow we have the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 14, and uh, you are encouraged to read the Aquinas commentary uh, if you're going to plan on attending that. And on Friday, we have Design Your Life. Uh, and the topic will be polymathy with Dr. Angela Cotalesa, uh, who will be back for the first time in a couple of years. Uh, so that's actually a very exciting uh, uh, meetup. And then we have our monthly meetup with remembering, remembering a remembrance of things, new spirituality, the future. Uh, what does it say? New Spirituality, The Future by Yasuhiko Kimura. And uh, that'll be Saturday at 11 uh, a.m. And as uh, Srikant had mentioned a little bit earlier, we have um, Harold Nelson joining us, uh, who is the author of The Design Way. And that is at 9 p.m. on Saturday. Uh, additionally, we have the Asian Philosophies uh, uh, meetup, and that is at 5 p.m. We'll be covering the Book of Changes. So um, we have a lot of great meetups coming up, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see some of you there. And uh, again, thank you for your time here at, this evening, Sanjay. It was a wonderful evening, and uh, I look forward to seeing everybody again soon. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Take care.